This is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. And I'm going to look at the subject of how to get victory over sin. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase, you can look, but you can't touch. However, a better saying is, don't look or touch. In 1 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So, many people say, I don't care if my spouse looks, as long as they don't touch. So here says, here Paul says, you shouldn't touch a woman. But Jesus also warns you about the look. The looking is bad. It's not good to look either. In Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So a look leads to a touch. A touch leads to something deep. A sexual sin. If you're not married, then don't look at a woman in lust or touch in any sexual way. The look leads to something deeper. The touch can lead to something deeper. And it just goes on from there. So a better saying would be, you shouldn't look or touch. And when dealing with the opposite sex, look at them as family. As it says in 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 2, it says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. If you looked at every woman in the workplace as your mother, if they're older, or as your sister, if they're younger, there would be a lot less adultery, a lot less divorce. And many men um, love the verses about greeting one another with an holy kiss. They love the shaking hands part of the service so they can go around and get their hugs from all the good-looking sisters in Christ. But Christian men are still men. And Paul said it's good for them not to touch a woman for that reason. So the first thing you should do is don't look or touch. That will really help you. Don't look at a woman that's dressed immodestly. And then don't touch a woman that you're not married to. Don't even hug them unless, you know, they insinuate it first, I guess. But it's just good not to touch a woman. The next thing is to get married. If you can't control yourself, then you need to get married. If you can't control your lusts. And verse 2 says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So this verse shows the primary purpose of marriage is to avoid fornication. It isn't because you're in love like on the movies. And after you're married, you need to treat each other right. And as it says in verse 3, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So you need to get married. You need to treat each other right. As it says in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, great verses on this subject. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Meaning, if your husband's lost, you can win him over to the Lord just by being a good wife. The verse 2 says, While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Now for the husbands, likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So you need to get married. The wife needs to be in subjection to her husband. The husband needs to treat the wife as the weaker vessel. and needs to honor her in that way. Treat each other right. And you'll 
can you can knock the sexual sin out of your life if you treat each other right you know make each other your best friend you're not going to have to worry about getting a divorce and once you get married render to each other what is due to your spouse treat each other right don't defraud each other so the next thing is once you get married don't defraud each other in the bedroom as it says in verse 4 and 5 the wife hath not power of her own body but the husband and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife defraud ye not the other except it be with consent for a time that you give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again that satan tempt you not for your incontinency so since your body is not your husband's or your wives or since your body is your husband's and your wives you shouldn't just deprive them in the bedroom as a punishment as some people do or because you have a headache or because you just don't feel like it uh, this gives room for the devil to slip in and tempt people because of their inconstancy that is their inability to control their lusts so you shouldn't defraud each other in this manner except it be with consent for a time giving yourself over to prayer and fasting and if you're fasting and praying during this time of being away from each other you'll be less likely to give into temptation from the devil during that time of separation for example maybe a man's job requires him to be away for a while then you should just pray and fast extra during these times uh, many times men are still childish and immature and will leave their wives every night to go hang out with the guys which I always thought was a little weird. This is bad for your marriage. Video games are hard on a marriage. You got men that just can't quit playing the video games. I'm concerned about a man who would rather play a video game than to spend time with his wife. These things of not touching someone you aren't married to and getting married if you can't contain yourself, these precautions will help keep you from committing sexual sin. And if you use marriage for what it's, what it's there for, this will help you have victory over sexual sin. A lot of people, they, they're married, and they have the opportunity to do what marriage is for, but they're spending all their time doing silly things like the men, as I said, spending all their time playing video games, hanging out with other men. You know, this gives room for the devil to slip in there. I've talked to people who say they don't want to get married because they just don't want, they, they just want to be, you know, a man whore or something and just pick up women all the time and not have to worry about going home to the same woman. But one day they're going to be old and lonely and wrinkly and they've wasted all those years without a different woman or with a different woman when they could have been making memories with one woman and probably picked up some STDs along the way that if they do decide to get married, then they'll end up giving them to her. But there's nothing good that can come from just man whoring around and living for the flesh. Nothing good comes from that. In verse 6 in 1 Corinthians 7, it says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So Paul is saying that the Lord didn't already say what he's about to say, but the Lord did give him permission to say it. So he says in verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself, which is, Paul isn't married, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. So Paul is saying he had a gift. His gift is that he can remain single and he wouldn't live in lust toward other women. He would like it if all the Corinthians, he would like it if all the saints were this way, but were not. And I've not actually met a person that was like Paul in this sense. And then in verse 7, or verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, which would be unmarried. So it would be good if the single people and the widows could stay single, but if they can't have victory over sexual sin without getting married, then they shouldn't abide even as Paul. So he says, but if they cannot contain let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn so he would rather them marry if they can't control their lusts 
So it's better to marry someone if you can't contain. It's better to marry than to burn. That's burning in your lusts. I know this may sound unromantic, but one of the greatest reasons you get married is to, to cure the lust problem. Now verse 10 says, And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So to the born-again Christian, he shouldn't separate from his wife, and the wife shouldn't separate from her husband. If you leave your husband or wife without any of the three grounds for divorce mentioned in the Bible, then you're committing adultery. And 1 Corinthians seven eleven says, But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So to avoid sexual sin during this occasion here, if you have a separation from your spouse, like this verse, chap, uh, verse 11 is referring to, don't join up with another man, and better yet, be reconciled to your husband. And the husband shouldn't put his wife, put away his wife. They should stay together. So if you're separated, the best thing you can do is be reconciled. Verse 12, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So you notice that phrase, the rest. The rest would be the married couples who have a saved person married to a lost person. So if you're in a situation where you are saved and married to someone who isn't saved, if she will stay with you, then you shouldn't put her away. If the lost man will stay with you and you're a saved woman, you shouldn't put him away. That's, what the re that's who the rest are, referring to a saved married to a lost. Now verse 14, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So if both the husband and the wife were lost, then the marriage wasn't honorable to begin with. But if one of them is saved, then the spouse is sanctified for their sake. Now, this doesn't make them saved in the sense that they're going to heaven. It just makes the marriage bed undefiled. As it says in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now, notice verse 15, but if the unbelieving depart, say that that saved woman's husband who's lost departs, says, if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So if your husband or wife departs, then you aren't under bondage. You are free to remarry, contrary to popular, popular belief. And if your believing wife refuses to stay with you, but seeks a divorce, then you could also take it before a couple Christians so they can try to help reconcile things. And if that doesn't work, you can take it before the church. And if she refuses to repent and get right, or if he refuses to do so, then you can count her as a heathen and a publican. You can count that saved person who refuses to repent, refuses to not commit adultery. You can take it before the church, and if they still won't get right, you can count them as a heathen and a publican. You can count them as an unbeliever. They may not be an unbeliever, but you can count them as one. Because it says in Matthew eighteen fifteen through 17, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So try to reconcile it first between you and your spouse. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. So, if he still won't hear it, take a couple Christians there, try to get it reconciled that way, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established, and if he shall neglect to hear thee, tell it unto the church. So, take it before them, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So if you have a spouse that refuses 
just flat out refuses to to repent and stay with you they just they're choosing to commit adultery if you do these things you can count them as a heathen you can count them as an unbeliever so if the unbelieving depart let them depart a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases so even though that person may have been saved if they're acting this way you can count them as an unbeliever so you're not you're not in bondage the rest of your life to never be married again so if you do this whether she is saved or lost or whether he's saved or lost then you aren't under bondage in such cases you don't have to live the rest of your life burning in lust like the pharisees teach you have bl these blind pharisees today who tell a 20 year old boy that he has to stay single after a divorce until his ex-wife dies no matter the circumstances so they cause the boy to burn in his lust for the next 30 40 50 60 years or until the death of his wife which she might die before he does so that teaching is very unbiblical because if he had one of the three grounds for divorce you know, his wife stepped out on him, deserted him, or died, then he's free to remarry and it not be a sin. And it wouldn't be adultery for him. In 1 Corinthians seven sixteen, For what knowest thou, O wife, where thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, where thou shalt save thy wife? You want to stay with your husband or wife, even if, they are lost because you might win them to the Lord. As I already quoted these verses earlier in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 2, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, when they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So a saved husband or wife can be a light in the life of a lost spouse. Many times you hear stories about a lost husband being led to the Lord by a praying wife. My pastor was a lost man for 27 years, and his wife was saved. She prayed for him every day. He eventually got saved and has been pastoring now for close to 30 years. So there you have a great example of that. The husband was won by the praying wife. Now, 1 Corinthians seven seventeen through 19, But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so I, I obtain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. So Paul is saying, if you're uncircumcised, which would be the Gentiles, or if you're circumcised, which would be the Jew, then don't worry about changing it. You're not saved by circumcision or uncircumcision. There is no commandment in the New Testament telling you to be circumcised. So just as you should remain the same on that, you should remain the same in your marriage. Don't depart from your spouse. And it says, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So if you're a servant, don't try to rebel against your master just because you got saved. Now you are just a saved servant. You have an earthly master. And now since you're saved, you have a heavenly master which is God. The moment you were saved, you were purchased by his own blood, and that's God's blood. You were bought, bought by a price. Now you can be a servant of Christ. The same way you are still a servant after you're saved, now that doesn't change. If you were a servant before you were saved, you were still a servant after salvation. And the fact that you're married doesn't change after you're saved, even if your spouse didn't get saved with you she's still your wife just because she's lost or just because your husband's lost after you get saved it doesn't change she's you're still married in verse 23 you're bought with a price 
be not ye the servants of men. When it comes right down to it, you serve the Lord. But you can serve the Lord by serving others. And you may not be a slave in the way this is referring, but you do have supervisors in the workplace. You are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. What that's meaning is, it's not meaning that you can't have authority over you. or some, you can't be. It's not saying you can't be the servant of someone. It's saying God first. You're, you serve him first. It's better to obey God than men. And as it says in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with our service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same things unto them, for bearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So you see there, you can be a saved servant. And the better you are towards your master, if he's an unbelieving master, you can win him over to the Lord. Now verse 24 through 26, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called... Therein abide with God. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose that this is good for the present distress, that is good for a man so to be. So the present distress has to do with Christian persecution that was going on. So he says, I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. So if thou, if you're divorced, or if you're married, don't seek to be loosed. And if you're loosed or divorced, then don't seek a wife. Unless, you know, you can't contain. Do you have a wife? Don't seek a divorce. If you've been divorced, then don't seek a wife. Because as Paul says, if you can bear it, you can serve the Lord better without getting married. But, the next verse, But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. So a man who has been loosed or divorced from his wife hasn't sinned if he, re if he remarries. And that's clear. If you are divorced, and had one of the three grounds for divorce and remarriage listed in the Bible, then you haven't sinned in remarriage contrary to popular belief. However, there is a catch. He said in verse 28, Such shall have trouble in the flesh. When you remarry, you run into problems with your spouse, with your new spouse's ex-husband or ex-wife. You run into problems with your ex-husband or ex-wife. You may run into problems with your new spouse's children. You will have trouble in the flesh because there will always be a bit of a connection with your old spouse. So you see, if you can, you need to try to stay married to your first husband or wife. I, you know, when you start talking like I'm talking in this, people think, well, you're soft on divorce. You're okay with divorce. No, no. Divorce is a sin without the grounds for divorce. It's just things happen in this life and God has, you know, prepared a way for people who these things happen to. Now verse 29 and 30 says, But this I say, Brethren, the time is short, it remaineth, that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though, re as though they rejoice not. And they that buy as though they possess not. He's basically saying if you're married, then serve the Lord, but put the Lord first. Put him before your wife, before your kids, no matter what state you're in. If you're if you're weak, if you're rejoicing, if you're buying or you're poor or you're bond or free, remember the world is temporal and the things of God are eternal. So serve the Lord. If you remember the things of this world are going to pass away, and that everything here is temporary pleasure, then that's a precaution to avoid sexual sins. 
Uh, everything's temporal. Everything here is going to pass away. The pleasures of the world are going to pass away. But what you do for God in eternity is something that will last forever. Now verse 31, And they that use this world is not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. So this world is going to go up in flames. He says in verse 32, But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. So when he says without carefulness, he's meaning like without worrying. As the Bible says, be careful for nothing. If you care too much and worry so much about the things of the world, then you're not going to serve God as good. And he that is unmarried careth for the things of the Lord. If you're not married, then you're more likely to serve God with guns blazing. If you're married, then you're worried about taking care of your wife and your kids. You're worried about your flesh more because your flesh has to be in shape to take care of them. But if you're not married, then you don't have that baggage. Now verse 33 through 34, But he that is married careth for the things that are of, this world, of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So if you're unmarried, then you're free to serve the Lord as many hours of the day as you want. But if you're married, you have a responsibility to your husband and to your wife. So if you can contain, if you can go being single and not lust, then you should stay single. Verse 35, And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So Paul doesn't want to make staying single a snare on someone, but if they can have control over their lust like he can, then they will be able to attend upon the Lord without distraction. You'll be able to spend all your time serving God, doing things of the Lord, without the distraction of a family if you can live as a single person without burning in lust then that is the wisest thing to do now it says in verse 36 but if any man think that he behave, behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin if she pass the flower of her age and need so require let him do what he will he sinneth not let them marry Nevertheless, he standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. So you see, it's good to get married, but it's better to remain unmarried. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So you have three grounds for divorce and remarriage in the Bible. And here, if your spouse is dead, you can remarry, obviously. And earlier we talked about if your husband or wife depart and desert you, you're free to divorce and remarry and it not be a sin. And then you're not under bondage in such cases. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 5.32, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So there you have a spouse stepping out on you and committing fornication is grounds for divorce and remarriage. But as Paul says here, only in the Lord. As he says in 1 Corinthians 7, you can only get married to a saved person. Never marry a lost person. But he says in verse 40 of chapter 7, But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So you would be happier if you stayed single, if you can. That way you can serve the Lord better. But this has been 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We talked a lot about the divorce and remarriage stuff. But the thing I wanted you to get was how to get victory over sin. How can you have victory over all this sexual sin plaguing the world today? And that is, you know, start living right. Find a woman or a man that lives right. You know, get married. And you can really put a dent in all this sexual sin that you have going on.